Okay, it's recording. Great, thank you. Hello, welcome everybody to this webinar, the first TDA webinar we have, um, and it's a webinar titled CO2 Measurements for Urban Freight. Um, my name is Sita Holtzloch, I work for the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and I'm the chair of the Community of Interest on Urban Freight from the Transport Decarbonization Alliance. That's the community of interest in organizing this webinar today. Um, the Transport Decarbonization Alliance is a group of countries, cities, and companies that aim to decarbonize urban freight faster to accelerate that. So that's the community of interest. One of the ways we want to do that is by sharing the knowledge and sharing good practices. And one of the ways we're doing that is this webinar here today. So we have two speakers today, or three actually, from two case studies. So we have Herman Bachter, the acting CEO at Big Mile in the Netherlands. And then we have two speakers in Portugal, Nuno Bonneville, the board member of MobiE, uh, Electric Mobility in Portugal, and Luis Reis, um, the head of business development at MobiE uh, in Portugal, or MobiE, sorry. I think there's a, a typo there. Um, so just some rules before we get started. This is the agenda. So as I said, we'll have a short introduction, then the first case and the second case. And after each uh, case study, there'll be some time for questions. So uh, this is really an interactive webinar. 
please ask your questions in the chat box uh, to the right on your um, GoToWebinar app. And the presenters will answer your questions after their short presentation and engage in the discussion. Another way is that you can press the raise your hand button, which is under the microphone uh, icon also on your GoToMeeting app. And then we'll hand over the microphone to you. Um, so before we get started, just some practical uh, issues. This webinar is hosted by SEIA, by the software of GoToWebinar by SEIA. And Zhao will be my co-host today. Um, he will be handing over the microphone to the people raising their hands. This webinar is also being recorded and will be shared on the TVA website at the beginning of next week. And if you're having any problems right now connecting or, or connecting to your, to your audio, also please mention it in the chat box so that Zhao can help you um, solve the problem as best he can. Yes? So I'd now like to hand over the, um, the screen and the microphone to the first speaker, which is Herman Wachter, acting CEO at Big Mile in the Netherlands. Thank you, Sita. Thank, Thank you, Zhao. Uh, good afternoon. Um, first introduction. Um, Big Mile we is. Are, we are not seeing your your screen. Okay, now we are. Yeah, it's working. Thank you. Working with webinars is always daunting at the beginning. <laughs> the technical part of it is, yeah. Uh, first, about who I am and what we're doing. Um, this is a currently a government funded project within the Foundation Connect with the ambition after a startup to uh, get uh, partly privatized to work together with private companies in, uh, in bringing this further. Um, but we already created the brand Big Mile for that. And could tell you a little bit about that and things that are associated with it, uh, focused on CO2 footprinting logistics in practice in urban areas. The first part is about an e-commerce emission predictor, which we created with the e-commerce uh, uh, coalition in the Netherlands and their transporters, which is a uh, online tool which is used by web shops and they can, and they are implementing that right now, per order per customer based on volume, origin and destination, give a pretty accurate prediction of how much, how big the CO2 emission will be to deliver that to that particular customer. And it's based on individual issues, based on real data from transporters converted to a model and uh, postal codes areas, about 16,000 in areas and service category differentiation, so quite complex. The secondly is more about Big Mile, which is analyzing from very direct data, which are transporters and fuel, what you can tell about supply chains and uh, where the CO2 emissions are and what to do. And thirdly, uh, quickly about if you implement that and uh, you quickly show where your emissions are, what you can do by very simple measures, which are currently implemented uh, uh, and on, in this case, by e-commerce. Let's first go to e-commerce emission predictor. Um, there are some, made most of the pictures. Of course, the basic process of e-commerce is some of the orders online, what to do. In the warehouse, the order gets packed into a box and then is transported first at night to a location where, by a big truck, where there is a sorting or a process. And then from the sorting area, it's shipped to a location next to a city by a big truck. And then in the morning, uh, vans, usually vans in the Netherlands, uh, pick up specific packages for an area and drive around to deliver to each individual customer the packages as we know it. Um, and everything is finished after the package is delivered. And the question is how to calculate CO2 emissions per package in such a, an environment in practice. Well, it turns out that in um, the uh, EN 16258-528 and in the COFRED uh, working group in the European Commission all a long time ago, a very practical method was designed, which had not been tested in practice. So we tested it in practice. And I'll give you a little bit idea about how it works based on an e-commerce example. 
if you have a van which is filled with packages, um, the, the driver has a delivery schedule. And it is a starting point, which is the, the distribution center. You basically have a postal code and in a, in a street and an individual address where a specific parcel or multiple parcels must be delivered. That is usually pretty good available. Um, the driver, of course, makes his round as is possible within the limitations of the city, traffic density, if people are home or whatever. Um, and at the end of the day, you can easily measure how much fuel is used. In this case, hypothetical example, 10 liter of diesel, which is 32.2 kilograms CO2 with a given emission factor. It, that's all you need. If you combine uh, these two data, then the question is how to allocate that CO2 to its delivery. Well, the COFRED process um, makes it a weighted average of distance. It basically this says you take the percentage of capacity that is used to transport, you take the bus flight distance from origin to destination, you add up, and you get the weighting factor of how much, what the percentage is of the CO2 which is allocated to this particular parcel. Um, the advantages of this is that the sequence of delivering doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's the first package or the last package or whatever it happens. Uh, the second is that the bird's flight distance is a, is a pretty good approximation of the added value. Uh, the third is that the, if you take the percentage of capacity of the, uh, the truck or the van, um, it's pretty easy to calculate. Usually it's volume. Um, in most cases, the maximum weight is not reached before the maximum volume is reached, which is the case in, in parcels. If you transport steel, coal, or beverages, it's usually the other way around. And then it's a weight, and you can use that. Um, and it turns out that this is a pretty fair allocation of CO2 to each delivery. If you have all the deliveries together, you say that you make the distance, the volume of the parcel, which is a percentage or a, a, a given uh, weighting factor for the capacity used, turns out into a weighting factor. And if you add up, you give a percentage and you give grams. In this case, distance two kilometers, four or two kilometers, the volume is 60, 16 or 190 liters, two times 60 is 120, point times 60 is 64, Two times 190 is 380. You add up and you get a weighting factor for the total CO2, which is assumed in this case 0.8 liter of diesel, allocated to each delivery. Um, but the theory was easy and the practice showed that it's a very good approximation. Of course, uh, usually you don't have three deliveries, you have much more, but the principle stays the same. And the easy thing is you only need what have you transported and how much fuel is used, then you can calculate what's happening. The calculation gives you uh, the total, the weighting factor, the total grams, but gives you also a uh, KPI, which in this case, the, uh, uh, this is the grams per kilometer per liter. And the interesting part uh, uh, this is per liter of uh, volume of, uh, of the packages. And the interesting part is that uh, in this KPI, um, all kinds of factors which influence effectivity are integrated. And if you look at the KPI average, uh, what is of influence in a given area? What's the fuel consumption? How efficient is the planning? Is the van fully loaded? How much fit in there? Is there stringent restrictions on delivery timing? Do you have to drive more? Traffic jams, detours? Have you low emission cycles, uh, vehicles or not? Nobody at home to have to drive back? Are you densely populated or not? All is uh, visible in this KPI. So what we did is to take a, a very large amount of measurements. Oh, sorry, uh, what you also see is the difference in service. Uh, if you have same day delivery or next day delivery, you usually see that the filling grade of the delivery fans is lower for same day than for next day. So you got service categories and everything else, which will tell you 
uh, in a specific area uh, integrated in the KPI what the normal practice is. Then you can turn it the other way around. If I know for a given parcel the distance, the origin and destination, it's easily to calculate the birth flight, you know the volume, you know the KPI, and you can calculate how many grams CO2 the predicted emission is. And in comparing prediction with practice, you see that the, the 80 20 rules is it's pretty good. It's pretty close to what's uh, actually happening. So, the, what we did is take a, a very large number of measurements in practice in all, all areas of the Netherlands from various transported averages. And now we have KPIs, including uh, not only delivery in the city, but also in the, in the rest of it, for each service area. And they can differ very much. It shows that. Uh, in cities, um, if you deliver about 50% of the of uh, CO2 emissions is in the last miles of uh, uh, delivery. Um, if you go in rural areas, it's 70 to 80% is the last leg is uh, uh, doing emissions, and to get it be effective in rural areas is very difficult. Um, what this has led to is that there is a big model which can be used by a uh, web shop currently. They input where it's coming from, where it's going from, know the address of the customer, they know the address of their distribution center, they know what the service category is, know the volume, and kaboom, in 10 milliseconds, you have a prediction of the emission. They're currently using this to, to create uh, a, to run uh, in, in background, uh, millions of orders to see where the revenues are, what's happening, and they're, uh, implementing it into a, a, a uh, some of them into uh, educating their customers in what the differences in choices are and what, what is made. Uh, integrated with that is that for many people, 294 grams CO2 is a totally irrelevant number which they cannot judge. And what is added to is how many meters can you drive with your car in a cold start before you have emitted 294 grams. And, and the surprise is then usually it comes it's, it's uh, hundreds of meters or a couple of kilometers and then you've spent the CO2 for this amount, the package is delivered over 100 kilometers to your home. So there's one approach of taking measurement data and creating into it a predictive model. Um, in the background, measurement uh, as currently is being implemented by people like PostNL in the Netherlands is both a tool which takes all these data from transport and uh, uh, normalizes it also if you don't have some cases you have less accurate data than others um, and make it visible in this case for more than uh, uh, permanent uh, logistics this is more in a country but in case people the visible in dashboards but also in uh, online tooling what the emissions are and what is happening uh, yeah. This is an example of, of a dashboard. This gives an example of the, the customers with the highest emission and the lowest emission. Uh, usually these differences are, if there's not, if the distance you have to drive are not in line with this uh, um, sequence, then something is going on. And people should, uh, should look at it. Usually looking at the outliers at the top three, four, five gives immediate action because people start to understand by the name of the customer, what's going on, and then the stories come. Um, so, if you look at most efficient, the most inefficient systems, uh, systems, you uh, people in logistics suddenly know what to do, and crazy stories come uh, come up, like uh, uh, in practice that the um, in, in a shipper of milk that the uh, they lost an order at a certain customer. Uh, volumes were halved, but the transport order they didn't know it. So the same number of trucks were still commissioned, but they were driving with 50% load. Um, and th that showed up in this kind of thing. Um, this is, you can do it per ton, per ton kilometer. This per kilometer is tells you a little about, about the loading efficiency. And that's very strange that these huge differences in uh, actual emissions are available and then people start looking into the regions and there are always millions of reasons and each one have a different story but now you know where to look at. I can uh, bore you with many of these uh, uh, outputs that are possible 
Um, but the main thing is once you have that basic data where you only need what did I transport it and what are the fuel uses to do so. In case you have a non-emission fuel like a uh, green uh, kilowatt hours, the same uh, indicators are calculated in uh, energy use to, to get the same efficiency factors. Um, but it makes it possible is to do a optional anonymous benchmark. Each dot is a, a given participant in the benchmark and the yellow dot on the right is, is you. Um, and it gives the data quality levels. You see bronze on the top, silver, gold, and gold plus. It says something about bronze is default factors used, silver is roughly estimated, um, usually in a year. Gold is pretty accurate monthly or more, so seasonality is visible. Gold is much better per trip or per day. Uh, funny enough, there are enough companies, multiple companies, who have weekly or daily data on fuel and what they use and easily can export that and can get tremendous information. Usually the step from yearly to monthly gives uh, seasonality factors which are often surprising. Uh, the interesting part of the benchmark against the market for participants is see where am I and what's the rest of Gives another example of your transport performance. Um, for more geographical areas, this is a nice place to to, to look at what's happening. Uh, that gives uh, uh, a green bubble is low, yellow is middle, and red is high. And it's often people surprising is, well, the, uh, the emission per ton in location very closely next to each other should be the same. And if it's not the same, something is going on. So it's a reason to look. And it's very easy if you have the data to derive indicators for various programs like Green and Green Smart Lake, like or up to so go to do so. Um, uh, people who are more interested for in, in, in drop density to do so can do other things and so forth and so forth. Um, one part of it that came of all these analysis in e-commerce is that uh, although a major part is the emissions per package is in uh, the last mile, and which gives a very good opportunity to drastically reduce emissions per part, also in the rest of the uh, chain, there are optimization issues. So these are actual um, uh, snapshots and measurements of uh, what is done in the rolling computer cages which are used for transport. There's also measurements done on uh, what's the filling grade of a, a e-commerce package and how to measure it automatically, uh, which also shows that the uh, flexible packaging and uh, variable height packaging makes a major difference in density. Funnily enough, um, people packaging these uh, roll cages uh, uh, appear to do this very efficiently um, using computer optimization with all kinds of freedoms, like in time, uh, could not increase this very much, only by 5 or 10 percent. And our people had trouble filling it better than the people at the, the end of the, the line did. However, if you look at trailers, the amount of open space and left space in the trailers is humongous. Um, and uh, currently, together with the transporters, uh, simulations are made if higher roll cages are the answer or loosely loading, uh, which is uh, more in, 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 uh, difficult in, uh, in, uh, in practice. But uh, easily optimization by 30% or more load per, per trip is possible. And delivery vans, usually you see this practice. Uh, it's not a problem of filling the van. It's problem of delivering at homes, which is the limit. Um, so there is, you see in the market over where various ways of transport to get rid of roll cages, different uh, cages, uh, uh, piece wrapping, uh, non-returnable uh, uh, funds, or, or because the relocation of roll cages is also costly in terms of CO2, and which are measured in practice to see if you see you can reduce CO2 emissions. Now here we've got the last part, which is loose loading. Uh, we see you, you stack uh, things in uh, without anything else, with some help. New tools are coming up. There are some logistic issues, but you see, for instance, in Canada, for longer trips, that it's absolutely worth the time and effort to fill this up this way. 
uh, and, uh, and add and, pro and mostly double the amount of load you have per trailer than with these roll cages. So these are various ways we are acting in uh, measuring what's happening in logistics now you can improve it and I'll tell people how to improve it how to create from data set big data supply chain intelligence and the first one is to use that data to use predictors to aid everybody in helping what's actually going on and what can be done thank you i'll look at the questions now thank you thank you herman for the presentation so if you have any questions for Herman, you can uh, write them in the chat box or you can push the raise your hand button. Okay, I have a question from Laura. Laurent wants to, I'm going to open the mic for Laurent Tridemi. Can you please present yourself and then ask the question, please? And you're on. So, yes, um, hello. Uh, so Laurent Tridemi, um, I'm working in Michelin company, the tire company. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, my question was, um, uh, how many companies use this, this tool today? Is it? A, a tool deployed in in um, in Netherlands, or do you use it with uh, in other countries uh, with other clients? No, we uh, we uh, tested for the last two years in the Netherlands with about eighty companies. We are now making it into a tool which can do large volume at low price. So the company like Postero Heineken and others, about forty are using it, and we in about three companies in Germany are using it because the first the trial and efforts uh, and the language changes in uh, making it practical um, take time because the for instance getting the data is a, a use is, is first a questionnaire on your profile and having an easy way of loading up data and they, these are language specific so we optimize it in the Netherlands and are rolling now out we, so okay. we we have six languages prepared the translation is coming up and uh, we started with Germany, German because most of the time German and French take the lowest, num highest number of characters in the software. But uh, <laughs> these are practical things. But the uh, the practicality, uh, the we have tested this uh, overseas with uh, in Bolivia or Colombia to see if uh, uh, with a little bit aid people could fill up fill the data, and uh, that worked pretty good. We tested with large multinationals with uh, supply chains, for instance, from beer to, from here to the middle of Nigeria, uh, and very small transport companies, and mama, mama and papa companies with three, four, uh, three, four uh, uh, trucks. And, he, and to our surprise, at least in the Netherlands, even the small companies have pretty good access to the data. I'm not so sure about if we go farther east or, or south, but. That, that we'll have to find out. I expect in France also that there is extreme high level of uh, data and same for Spain and, uh, and Portugal. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Please raise your hand if you have questions or type in in the chat box. Okay, I have a question from Jerome. Do you want you raised your hand. Well, I'm Jerome. You raised your hand. Do you do you yes. want to ask a question? Can you introduce yourself first, please? Yes, Jerome uh, Marcel. I work for the French Agency of uh, Environment. Well, your your sound. We have we are having difficulties. Do you hear me now? Yes. I work for the French Agency of um, Environment, ADEM. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're familiar with that. Yes, we worked on the Objective CO2 program. Uh, I have one question. The companies which use the tool, um, do they use the CO2 information? Uh, 
for the customer when one of the customer order from the website uh, can they see the co2 impact of their order there these uh, e-commerce companies are testing the integration uh, well, a couple of them are testing the integration with the tool right now the marketing people are a big, big anxious about time delay in the checkout. Apparently, that's a very big thing in e-commerce. And how to um, position that in terms of that dialogue with the customer. In the Netherlands, a special brand for B2C CO2 awareness has been created, uh, which is conscious delivery or a special delivery sign with a green or whatever. Um, so they are they're testing out how to get the information. Okay. So it's it's uh, sorry I, I didn't hear very properly. It's uh, you mean it's under consideration from from the web from the website uh, from the web shops. Yes. It is. yes. Okay. So the first. Okay, so the first part. The first part of the first Okay, there was a big echo. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The first part of my presentation was about a specific tool made for the e-commerce uh, sector to predict, which is separate from the second part, which is analysis for uh, transport companies and uh, shippers business to business uh, in how to do so. So I was assuming the question was about the first part and uh, where the uh, predictor now is uh, in being integrated in the bigger web shops in the Netherlands and the smaller web shops in to show their consciousness to the customer of uh, CO2 emissions, but also to influence the uh, customer in the decision. One of the big parts that is currently on a, on a negotiation is integration is sending back clothes, uh, which is a big part of uh, returns. Thank you. Thank you very Hello. much. Do you have any more comments? Your mic is on now. It's OK. Thank you for the answer. OK. Thank you, Jerome. So any more questions? Please raise your hand. If okay. there's no other questions, I think we can move on to the to the next presentation. Or is there another question, uh, Joao? There's no other questions. No one is. No? No, we can move on. OK. So I'm, I'm going to hand the, the I'm going to hand the, the, the slideshow to Nunu, OK? Nunu, you are on. No. Okay, good. Okay. Is the image clear? Yes. Can you put it yes. like okay. full screen? Maybe it will. Yes, I can, I can. Give me just one second. It's it's on top. It's that that small blue icon next to the, to the zoom. I think. Yeah, that's yeah. one. Yes, I think. Yeah. Well, it's better. Perfect. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity of presenting the, the Portuguese electric mobility model. And I'm Nuno Vanville. I'm from Mobi. It's a governmental company under the, the supervision of the environmental ministry. And we act as a, a clearinghouse to the system management of electric mobility in Portugal. So, first of all, uh, I would like to give you a, a, a little background of how we started the looking at mobility, electric mobility. So we started the, to think about these questions in 2009. And at that time, we wanted to, to make, uh, uh, to address the, the 
the CO2 emissions and also take advantage of the high production of renewables in our country. So uh, we wanted also to um, to 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 uh, to take benefits. Sorry, of our uh, entrepreneurship, and we wanted to roll out uh, a pilot model that uh, um, that uh, was designed with the deployment of uh, charging stations and a system management. All of this focused on the end user. We wanted to, to provide the most uh, seamless option to the end user. So we, we started the, the deployment in 2011. And in the meanwhile, we, had, we, had, uh, we went through an economical crisis, as everyone knows, and uh, the project slowed a little bit down. So in 2014, we took, we took once again the, the step forward on this uh, project and at that time we designed a complete legal framework towards electric mobility uh, that uh, puts once again the, the user at the center of the question. So, as I uh, said before, uh, Portugal uh, would like and wants to take advantage of the, the I, uh, percentage of renewable production and with that in mind we, we tried to, to design a model uh, 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 with the deployment of the charging stations and then from the, 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 the policy framework we wanted to, to give some fiscal incentives and direct subsidies for EV drivers in order to raise the, the, the sales of EV uh, EVs in Portugal. Some, some municipalities also uh, provided free parking uh, and in the, in the public network, it's wide, uh, country-wide coverage, the, the charging is free until the pilot goes into the market phase. We, we also have a, a, a very, a very uh, a concern. Uh, with the, the address and with the awareness of the CO2 emissions. So, as you can see here, uh, this represents clearly the, the model that is in place right now. Uh, we have a nationwide uh, program, uh, full interoperability, uh, and national uh, roaming. So, the, the, the Portuguese user it can reach and use all the charging stations deployed in, in, the, in, in the country with only one solution that's managed through our system. Here you can see the, the, the network coverage of, of the system. And uh, we have at the moment uh, more around six, 608 uh, charging stations. Uh, for 400 of them are normal charging from 3.4 to 22 kilowatts hour and uh, we have 58 fast charges in place right now so this means uh, like 1500 plugs in total uh, in, 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 in the coverage right now we have 69 municipalities uh, along the, the country but we already have users from 198 municipalities. And we, from, from day one up to now, we already have uh, 15 uh, people coming through abroad and using our system. This is the, the in 2016, there, there was another push in the, in the, in the project. And we started to deploy the, the fast charging stations, the 50 kilowatts uh, uh, charging stations. With this, we, we started to cover all of the, the, the main highways in, in Portugal and the, the capital cities, uh, cities of the, um, the municipalities. So the, the, the most important cities in, in, in Portugal are already covered with at least one charging, fast charging uh, station. With this, and from that time on, the, 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 
uh, makes this autonomy. The autonomy of the, the electric vehicles uh, also started to change. And, and uh, since Portugal, it's not a, a very big country in, in, uh, uh, in uh, wide uh, in length, in lengths of territory, sorry. Uh, nowadays, it's possible to go from south to north of Portugal and from one end to another with a totally uh, electric vehicle. For, for this, the, the fast chargers were very important. Here we can see uh, the, the numbers from the beginning uh, up to now. And as you can see, uh, we have a, a, a very big growth in the in the last few years with the amount of users, with the amount of uh, electric cars. To give you an example, uh, in last January, we sold as much EV cars as the old 2017 year. Uh, we sold in January uh, 750 electric vehicles. So the the the, um, the network is growing uh, each day. Um, and in the top, uh, you can see the energy consumed through, throughout the, the program since the beginning, the, the charging operations. The users nowadays, uh, we have about 10,000 uh, users in the network. And the most important to our conversation, I, I, I think, it's the CO2 avoided in the, in the usage. And this is only possible to the system we use, it, it relates the, the energy consumption, the, the using usage, uh, and the charging operations with the CO2 avoided in, in, in the old package. As you can see, the, the big number downside, the 65 million kilometers already covered with this system. Uh, Louise will, will talk a little bit further uh, about the the management system, the more technical questions, and he will try to, to explain uh, uh, how this works. One other uh, important, and I'm, I'm already ending my presentation, but one thing very important in the Portuguese model is, uh, as I said, we are centered in the user, but we also have a model that allows, uh, at least we want it to do so, that allows the, the open market and the competitiveness among the, the, the players. We have, we have a particularity, particularity uh, uh, from the, the other systems in place in the rest of Europe, it's, we have a, a direct connection to the electric grid. So uh, a customer, when he uses the, the charges in, in Portugal, when the market will be at place in, in, in full in the end of this year, he will also he will pay the service of charging and we will pay the electricity that he used in that charging, uh, especially for the electric mobility. And this is only possible because Mobi acts as a clearinghouse to all of the system. We connect the CPOs, we connect the EMPs, and we, we clear the system with a direct connection we have to the electric grid. Uh, I think I will be available for the questions, and thank you so much once again. Well, if you could make, I'm sorry, if you could make me the presenter. No, no, it's the, the question, I think. Oh, it's the questions. Joan? I think Joao is muted right now, I'm but he sorry. can probably hear you. I was muted, sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Before, I, before I, I pass the, the desktop to Luis Leish, let me just say that there are three questions that were placed on the chat box that I only realized now, they will be answered after Luis Leish speaks, okay? Okay. So, Luis, you are... The presenter now. Okay. Nunu, can you turn on your 
your your sound, please. Okay. Okay, there you go. Okay. Go ahead, Luis. Thank you. So we've, we have been engaged uh, for some years now in uh, um, projects re related to uh, uh, emissions avoidance and, uh, or emissions tracking and avoidance. One of the cases that we uh, worked from the beginning is, is exactly the case of, uh, of Moby Me, of Moby Yi. Uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of uh, uh, who we are, I think João might have uh, uh, explained to you, but uh, say, uh, and uh, Moby Me, which is, uh, let's say, the, the business unit that we are now, uh, um, that is now gaining way towards a spin off of SAYA, um, is a, a technological unit of SAYA, which uh, manages a platform, a technology platform uh, that we call Moby Me, and uh, that supports, uh, that is built like a mobility marketplace that handles the management of different uh, mobility services and verticals if you want to and then enables uh, an integrated or, or cross uh, management of some of these verticals what do i mean by this is that we support projects uh, uh, for the directed at fleet management but also directed at ev fleet management directed at shared operations based on evs directed at charging so we can work complex cases where uh, uh, operators or our partners can handle uh, fleets that are based on DVs, can, ha can uh, have the support of uh, uh, smart charging management, can have a partner that works with them around B2C or B2B uh, shared solutions. So it's a very flexible uh, uh, technological uh, uh, platform that is built in the very end to enable fully integrated mobility management in the context uh, uh, of cities. Um, some of the cases that we work have just uh, already mentioned, but we work towards integration and uh, complexity, uh, complexity. As you know, the, to, the transition towards EV integration is in fleets is gradual. So we do a work that goes from understanding the, the potential of electrification and providing the support for the real implementation or the real integration uh, in EVs and the, the integration of the, the new reality that EVs pose within the larger uh, landscape of whoever operates a, a fleet or a given or a, a given service. We uh, this is a, an interesting point when we address the issues of uh, uh, tracking emissions. We want to retrieve information that we can get from the vehicle side and for the vehicle side and other devices we use hardware that enables us to tap in the vehicle to, to connect to the vehicle retrieve information and uh, give commands to, to the vehicle but we also work on the infrastructure side and what this means is that we can have a 24 7 track of the use of the use of, of a given vehicle even when vehicles charge at home or at locations that don't have connected EVSEs, we can track whatever happens in the vehicle, understand um, if the vehicle was charged, with what with uh, what amount of energy, and we can uh, somehow infer, get, get an inference of some of the information that we might be lacking when we uh, uh, address only the, the, the infrastructure side. One of the cases that uh, uh, we've been working from the beginning is, uh, in fact, MobiMe, with MobiE which, uh, which uh, uh, Nuno has mentioned. And uh, we are partner, technology partners to Mobi E. And further than that, we have been working with Mobi e in the design and implementation of a, uh, a somehow complex yet comprehensive uh, a model for electric mobility here in Portugal. That, as Nuno has mentioned, has a particular uh, focus on uh, impact assessment. And uh, I can tell you, I think, I don't know if Nuno mentioned that, this project that started with a pilot project uh, for uh, infrastructure layout here in Portugal was partially funded by the Portuguese government fund, which means that the, the, the project was uh, partially uh, funded based on uh, selling avoided emissions to this, to this fund. So uh, this means that from the very, uh, the very early stage, every approach that uh, was taken at the project included the, the, the tracking and the impact assessment, in essence, uh, the tracking and measurement of all CO2 
<clears throat> that is handled within this very wide infrastructure that, as Nuno mentioned, covers all, all, all the country. We have we, we join this uh, these projects that we have started from the EV side with fleets, and uh, in fact, the the, the one of the mo most complex cases is uh, green and shared fleets, meaning we are partners to uh, shared operations. We have you have some examples there where uh, uh, vehicles are uh, managed uh, under, let's say, a, a fleet management approach, but they include EV, <laughs> they partially or totally are, uh, they are partially or totally based on EVs. And then the next step is to share the EVs and gain efficiency, uh, reduce the number of, of, uh, of cars that are handled within a given fleet, attribute vehicles to specific, specific function, functions or specific uses, and we do this all based on the on the system and on let's say the digitalization of all uh, of all the process. Um, one of the one interesting project that well it's a bit off topic but I never nevertheless would like to mention is that this is the case in, in Cascais, is a, a city in the vicinity of Lisbon in the urban area of Lisbon, where we integrate all of these services within the mobility as a service approach. And one of the metrics that we have for users to choose their best route from getting from A to B is, uh, is in fact lower impacts. And we, ba we base this partially on the, on the, the algorithms or on the, the models that we have for tracking emissions for, uh, um, for, with real live information for some of, the, of the, the verticals or the vectors. Others, we do an estimation, but this is a, a, this is a very important, uh, uh, let's say, factor for awareness uh, of uh, the, to the users of commuters regarding uh, uh, emissions and EVs. Um, going back to the uh, to Mobi -E and addressing Mobi, -E, uh, the the, design, the the program was designed uh, starting in uh, mid 2008, and uh, some of the issues that Nuno already mentioned were critical, and uh, you must understand that at the time there was no knowledge of what uh, an electric mobility market would be. This is 2008. But some of the issues that we discussed at the time with the government and uh, when we designed the, the process was to, first of all, have a very articulate and interoperable market that would result in clear and transparent co competition for the user. But at the same time, the ability to uh, uh, integrate renewable energy, green energy, promote zero uh, emissions mobility, and in the end, uh, integrate information that enables users to base their decisions, uh, to base some a part of their decisions on on, the, on on impacts or avoided impacts. This was a key issue from the beginning, and uh, once again, this was uh, 2008. To give you an overview of the architecture of the system, and this is uh, pretty much what is common, uh, uh, except for Mobi, what is common for an architecture for electric mobility. You have charge point operators, you have uh, electric mobility providers which in Portugal are called SEM, but we have one singularity, is that uh, EMPs here in Portugal provide electricity for EV charging, and this is not included in the service that is provided by CPOs. So users engage with a specific EMP in order to have access to some of the CPOs, and they are able to, with the, with the integration of IMOBE, they are able to charge at any location, at any charging station that is available to the public by any CPO, and they carry their electricity in their pocket. And when we say carrying their electricity, they carry the, the, their energy mix with them. This is something that is very particular uh, here of the, of the Portuguese case. You know that um, in Germany you have a, a, great, a very large momentum that is imposed by Habject, you have Girev, in, uh, in France, you have uh, e-violin in the Netherlands, and uh, there are many movements towards interoperability and the electric mobility roaming. But the issue of electricity roaming within the LA electric, electric mobility landscape is something that is pretty much unique to the Portuguese case. There is something that is extra, and that, that is interesting in the case of, of, uh, of fleets. It's that sometimes uh, the ability to move from, uh, 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 let's say, the current paradigm where uh, uh, um, users uh, have fuel vehicles that they fuel at the, at the fuel station, 
then if they take their vehicle home or if they they're charged at their condominium how can they ensure make sure that uh, they have access to their electricity their electricity that they have chosen to charge their vehicles at private locations and there's this figure of dpc which in rough translation is like uh, the uh, owner of a, of, a, of a charging station that through the connection to Mobi is able to charge their uh, his vehicle at home or a group of vehicles if it's a, if it's a fleet and uh, through Mobi there is a an integration a clearing between the delivery the delivery meter of that uh, of that of that facility and uh, let's say the consumptions that are uh, gen generic consumptions and electric mobility consumptions that enables uh, users to uh, i'm sure this will be a question for, for for after but i'll try to make this simple that enables users to charge their vehicle anywhere with their electricity so in essence we can say that uh, with this uh, system that is in place in portugal where mobi does not just act as a clearinghouse for let's say business and service clearing they also act as a clearinghouse for electricity. We enable users to have electricity roaming and to have an end-to-end -end tracking of their emissions, i.e. their uh, uh, selected electricity package for charging their electricity uh, solution for charging their vehicles that they can take uh, virtually uh, anywhere. So this is very specific of the Portuguese case. <clears throat> for the, we have been working around very simple yet comprehensive algorithms that enables us that enable us to to keep track of avoided uh, emissions this is the algorithm or the the case that we use for uh, um for uh, uh, let's say the wider the wider the, the wider the wider scope where we keep track in the case of evs we keep track of the electricity mix that goes into the into the network um and we uh, uh, with uh, very uh, with uh, with uh, metrics with with uh, with uh, the other put metrics we translate this into avoided emissions against uh, against the given baseline uh, and this is one of the ways that we keep track the, we we track all the emissions within the overall uh, mobi uh, mobi network where you can see i believe in the next slide if it goes there nuno has mentioned it already we have real-time uh, 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 tracking of uh, avoided emissions for, and we can take this down to the level of a given user or, or a given fleet, have, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a segregation uh, for a given CPO or for a given ENP. So this is pretty much real-time. And uh, the way that we do it, the, the way that we do this can uh, um, allow, allows us to have different times, different levels of, of analysis in the case of uh, of fleets as i mentioned we have a, we we add an additional layer we keep track of uh, what's happening on the vehicle side so that enables us to calculate uh, information based on uh, on uh, um, on the on the vehicle use and then we we plot this against uh, the information that we get from the infrastructure side and based on real-time information that we get from the power grid, we are able then to uh, attribute avoided emissions to a given trip, to a given use, and keep this track of this in a on a, on a, in a real-time basis. One thing, one interesting aspect is that as we keep track of the the different charging events, we the battery acts sort of like a a, a repository of CO2 that is already being charged at a given moment in time. And we use that uh, uh, when we when we compare that charging to uh, 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 to later to charges that occur later uh, in the network. So, uh, addressing specifically the case of fleet, uh, we usually start by uh, assessing the potential for electrification. This is the case of the municipality of Porto, where we did a pre-study of the potential of electrification for their fleets. And based on this work, they were able to uh, turn 70% uh, of their vehicles, I mean, uh, light passenger and commercial vehicles into electric vehicles. Why? Because they fit a given uh, uh, electric vehicles that are that were available in the market at the time, fit a given profile, of course. And we could assess that they would have something like more than a 
one kiloton of, of, uh, of uh, CO2 savings. Uh, this is a part of the, the back end that we have. I think this is a sharing operation where you can see that we keep track of the different uh, use or charging events that occur uh, at the level of either the vehicles when we have them connected to the platform or the charging stations when we have them connected uh, to the to the platform. This is today part of the uh, part of the uh, fleet operation of Porto after the, the initial assessment. This is uh, today, and I can also give you some examples of not only the complexity that is on the vehicle side, but also the complexity that is on the infrastructure side. This is a, a simple dashboard of some of the uh, 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 let's say load management support that we provide to the municipality to this particular case there are many where we help them um, have a proper dimensioning of the infrastructure meaning uh, have an adequate number of charging stations and an adequate number of infrastructure that together with intelligent uh, management of vehicle use and uh, and loads can uh, uh, reach an optimum in terms of capex opex and uh, and uh, vehicle availability and to finish i can show you some <clears throat> some other dashboards this case is a it's a public fleet also uh, or some dashboards where we keep track of uh, uh, different emissions not only co2 but uh, other uh, other emissions as you can as you can see this is based on, on real-time information an idea also on savings, so the, this metric is Euro savings, and we're trying to achieve metrics regarding uh, Euro per, per, per kilometer. Uh, and then we can also keep track of uh, uh, supply of energy uh, uh, within uh, um, an infrastructure that we, that we keep track of, and this can be the, 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 uh, the uh, fleet, the, the, the infrastructure that is owned and operated by the fleet operator. But in this particular case of Portugal, where we have one single point of, uh, or, or where we can reach a single point of information for the whole network, that is MOBE, we can in fact integrate information um, whether the vehicle charges on infrastructure that is held by the fleet operator, or if the vehicle charges on infrastructure that is publicly accessible and that provides uh, information to uh, MOBE. So um, I tried to be brief. There were there was there were a number of slides, but um, I'm available to any questions that you may have. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nuno. Um, Zhao, I think you mentioned before that, um, or sorry, Luis and Nuno, both of you. I think Zhao, you mentioned before there was already three questions uh, in the chat box. Yeah, can can you see the, those questions, or am I the only one that sees the questions? I think you're the only. I can't see them at least. You can. You're the only one. I, I cannot see them. Okay, so I have here three questions, and this is in respect to the previous presentation. Okay, so we will get back. I think it's better than. Okay, so to Herman. Yeah. The questions are to Herman. Okay. Ah, Herman. Uh, just a second. Okay, so the questions are from Wendell. Wendell Krill. I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing well. The questions. The question is: Are order returns included in the emission calculations, or should these figures be increased? With e-commerce, return rates between twenty to thirty percent the product may increase the emission figure significantly by the time a product reaches its final destination. It's like a, a, a question and a comment, I think. Herman, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes. Um, this is, of course, a big debate issue always, how to incorporate that. And, and the uh, agreement between um, the e-commerce uh, parties and the uh, and us and the uh, and how to make a practical calculator is that if you order seven uh, um, deliveries uh, and send back six, you the, the the one that is remaining is gets allocated to seven uh, um, uh, seven times one 
parcel uh, uh, CO2, so a heavy CO2 burden. Um, that is the most effective way to do it. The other uh, uh, in, in the generic model, uh, we have the option of having very specific tables and modeling for a specific combination of a, a certain business and a transporter, if available. Uh, and if there are regular returns, uh, so there are more averages, especially in some of the retailers have uh, e-commerce retailers are specialized in clothing. Uh, then uh, different numbers are included into the uh, KPIs to reflect the standard number of uh, uh, returns. So yes, it is included in the numbers to do so. Uh, but uh, up front, uh, at order time, you have to take an assumption because you don't know how much is sent back yet. Okay, thank you very much, Herman. Thank you. Uh, just looking at the time, um, it might be interesting to have some questions for the second uh, case study, so for Nuno and Luis. Um, and any other questions can be sent to Herman. So, uh, Zhao, if you if you share the screen, my screen again, I can share the contact info. Um, and then any further questions can be sent to Herman uh, via me, via the TDA Secretariat. You have the screen now. Uh, no, not yet, sorry. No, not yet, I think. Too many open windows, okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, no. So any questions can, to Herman can be sent to the TDA Secretariat and uh, I will make sure to contact you with him. Okay. Um, so just to get back to uh, Nuno and Luis, are there any questions for them? Uh, in the chat box, Joe. No questions in the chat box and no uh, raised hands so far. So oh, okay. Please raise your hands if you want to ask any question or type in in the chat box. Well, if there are no questions, no extra questions for uh, Nuno and Luis, maybe then we still have a little bit of time to answer the questions that were asked before. Um, okay. Is that an idea? Can you can you read them aloud again? Yes. I think that works okay. very well. I think there's only one more question because okay. the other one from Jerome, I think he actually asked um, through the mic. Raising his hand. Raising his yeah. hand. Okay. So the question is from Pedro Filippi, and it's um, and it reads: How do you gauge the fuel? The fuel. How do you gauge the fuel? And let me just give the mic to Herman. Well, his his mic is on already. Herman, how do you gauge the fuel? The fuel. Okay. <clears throat> the um, in uh, if you use the Big Mile tool, the uh, uh, there are six options depending on what data availability is with um, uh, the uh, options also translate into a certain level of data quality, of data maturity. So we have four levels of data maturity, bronze, silver, gold, gold plus. And it depends if people make assumptions or not. So the lowest level is there is an assumption on the total amount of fuel used. The second is some of the um, estimates and calculates the uh, trip made and has some averages of a specific uh, vehicle or set of vehicles <clears throat> and the third level is um, uh, fuel consumption per day or per week total is known and the fourth level is that trip computers give actual uh, fuel consumption over a given trip between stops all uh, are available in the market all uh, are, are there and the, the practicality we use is that uh, if somebody has a fuel option, he must give, she, she must give uh, uh, what the basis of the fuel is. And then it gets translated into this amount of data has this level of, of quality or maturity. And in the end product in aggregation, all these details are kept. So if a certain level of aggregation level you see all all trips in a month or a certain area you can select and drill down okay how much of the data is very accurate and how much of the data is estimated um, and also if you uh, deselect and drill down to specific trips you can see that 
and what we often notice is that very quickly people find out what type of data is essential for their business and then take some effort to improve the data but it allows people who only have assumptions to in, in to still calculate the supply chain or something else okay thank you very much um are there any other questions last questions before we end this webinar no no one raising their hand, Joe, I think? No one is raising okay. their hand, and okay. no one is typing in questions, as far as I understand. So I think your presentation was very clear, Nuno and Luis, that there's no questions uh, for you. I would see that as a, as a big compliment also. Um, so I would like to, yeah, to thank you both, okay. the presenters. Have, both Laura have. is raising his hand. Ah, okay, so last question before we end the webinar. I'm going to connect. Laura, the mic, the mic is yours. Yes. yes, thank you. Just to know if um, uh, will these uh, presentations uh, will be, uh, be be available? Um, how? Yes, the... so we will we will share the webinars being recorded. And we will share the webinar on the TDA website in the beginning of next week. Okay. Is that enough? Does that answer your question? Not yeah, enough? it's okay. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Perfect. That was a very nice practical one. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we can end the webinar now. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, both speakers, uh, so both from the Netherlands and Nuno and Luis from Portugal. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you to all the yeah. yeah. Thank you for all the participants for attending today and helping us with our first uh, Community of Interest webinar. If you have any comments or tips for us, there will be a link sent out uh, through SEA. And please email any suggestions you have uh, to the email address stated in that email. And also know that there will be two more webinars at least coming up this year organized by the Community of Interest. And we look forward to seeing you then. So I wish you all a very happy weekend and thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. thank you. Bye.